We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings from Tbilisi, Georgia. This is Vern Power, the anadromist. And today we've got something a little different. I've decided, I just came back from seeing the the new film by Todd Phillips starring Joaquin Phoenix, Joker. And I was really impressed. I felt this film had something to say, not only about our times, but about human nature itself. But before we get going here, if you're interested in seeing the film, I would say this. I am going to completely ruin the plot of the film here. I'm not interested in reviewing the film. I think it was pretty amazing. And there's a lot of people who will give you their reasons why you should or shouldn't see the film. I want to give you what I saw. I'm going to, this is going to be more film analysis than film review. So... But one thing I've noticed is uh, when I saw this film, I felt that the first uh, part of the film, up until the moment when the Joker uh, goes on to a talk show uh, where Robert De Niro is playing the host, um, I felt that that, up till then, was a great uh, tribute and homage to Martin Scorsese, uh, 70s films, uh, this dark period of New York City, which I have a lot of connections to because I actually arrived in New York City in 1980 and can attest to just how dark. They really did a great job of capturing the, the craziness of the city at that moment. Uh, things were going to change in the 80s, but... But at the beginning of the 80s, it was still a lot like the end of the 70s. And But then came the scene with the talk show, which I'll discuss later. Um, and I felt from there to the rest of the movie, the film just like blasted off into another dimension entirely and ceased being uh, any sort of tribute to the past and became something that was definitely concerned with the things of the present, but not only the things of the present. I don't think it's a movie that's going to be bound in the, uh, you know, 2019. You know, it's not just going to be seen about relating to our current uh, politics and such. I think this movie is going to have a lot of resonance going on into the future. What is interesting for me is that since the beginning of the 21st century, we have uh, slipped through different incarnations of the the monster that causes us fear at the beginning of the 21st century it was still vampires vampires had been popular for quite a while and we still had quite a few vampire films which were finally killed off by things like twilight and true blood uh, twilight in particular bears a lot of blame for turning it into kitty fair uh it then slipped into becoming the zombie as this this mindless post-George Romero zombie that became the heart of uh, fear for us. And I think, you know, the zombie and the vampire, to a degree, are still very resonant for us. But subtly, something has shifted, and we have a new, strange figure of fear, which has grown almost out of nothing, it seems. Uh, you know, if you were to ask someone in the 1970s, uh, you know, different monsters and figures of fear, this this figure would not appear on the list at all. And that figure would be clowns. Clowns, and the king of the clowns would be Joker. I mean, there's never been a period of time so entirely dedicated to the teleological notion that fun is the meaning of life. That is really strange, and that is where we are. Uh, fun has become a reason to live for many people. The criticism, hey, it's all in fun, is supposed to like be enough to quell any dissent. If someone says, yeah, we were just having fun, that should be enough to silence any criticism leveled towards anything. Uh, and, and of course, people return from a superhero movie and they go like, gee, that was fun. 
Uh, they'll play video games. You know, that was fun. Uh, if something is fun, that should be enough to silence all the grumpy haters who have anything critical to say. So, fun. Meanwhile, everything needs to become fun. Capital F, fun. Food is fun. Math is fun. Heck, education is fun. Reading can be fun. As long as you don't have to read those long, boring books from the uh, 20th century and before, you know. Uh, horror films can be fun. Uh, big budget Hollywood movies had better damn well be fun if they're going to recoup their investments from the latest, like, superhero blockbuster. Uh, fashion is fun. Health can be fun. Signs in uh, clinics uh, basically let you know that medical treatment really is fun, no matter how painful it is. It really is fun. Uh, you know, you put a smiley face. Be positive. Everything in in health is going to be fine. Don't worry about your cancer treatments. Be positive. Have fun. Um, let's see what else. Oh, driving is fun, of course. And drinking is fun. And drinking while driving can be fun up until that final moment when the car wraps itself around the tree. Hmm. How did that? How did it change at that moment? Well, maybe it changed a little earlier, but we didn't notice. Uh, dogs and cats are fun and cute, but don't get me started talking about cute. Cute's a real problem. Um, computers and phones are fun. Memes are hella fun. Go into a church these days, and guess what? God is fun now, too. And what isn't fun now? Things that are boring. Boring isn't fun. Boredom isn't fun. And so reading long books, not fun. Repetitious jobs, standing at counters. But can I have my phone to work with me? No, those things aren't fun. Uh, 1970s movies are no longer very fun, unless it's like Jaws or Star Wars. But, you know, uh, Raging Bull, that's not fun. Taxi Driver, not fun. And that's going to become very important to our discussion. Along with films like Network, uh, Martin Scorsese's King of Comedy, not exactly a fun film about comedy, which plays very much into the film Joker. Um, let's see. History. Ooh, that isn't fun. Uh, paintings aren't fun. You just start, stop and look at them. I mean, you can just swipe through on your uh, phone or pad instantly. In fact, yesterday itself isn't fun. Remembering anything from the past. Cultural traditions, not fun. Uh, religion, yeah, it just doesn't sound fun. Jesus on the cross, definitely not fun. But baby Jesus, oh, that's fun and cute. And do you know what else isn't fun? Clowns. The very symbol of fun is no longer fun anymore. They have become the symbol of fear. And Joker, the Batman villain, is the king of the scary clowns. Okay, so let's look into the origin of clowns and jokers and explore Todd Phillips' film Joker a little bit more. In fact, settle in. We are not going swimming in the kiddie pool. The clown has its origin, of course, in things like jesters and fools back in the Middle Ages. Now, what's interesting is that Every culture has had its tricksters and shaman, but uh, for our purposes to understand the Joker and also this weird fear of clowns, it's probably best that we go back to the Middle Ages and examine a bit of the court fool, the court jester. We're also going to discuss the clown and the origins of the clown. And one of the origins of the clown is to be found in masks, particularly masks that uh, we see in the carnivals of Europe. And one of the most important carnivals is the carnival in Venice. Let me give you just a word about carnivals. 
Carnival is a distinctly Catholic custom, although variations on these sort of taboo-breaking moments have been held in other cultures. The period before Lent, uh, Lent being the period where you are supposed to fast, is a period which it's kind of like, okay, now we're repenting for our sins. And in Catholic uh, custom, you had Ash Wednesday, which correlates with uh, Jesus in the Bible. But Fat Tuesday comes before, or Mardi Gras, which is the American variation on the Catholic custom of Carnival. And you find Carnival wherever you find a largely Catholic uh, culture or former culture. Some places in Switzerland aren't particularly Catholic, but they still have Carnival as they do in some places in uh, the West Indies. But the Venetian Carnival is distinct for the use of masks, and the masks are there to create a sense of anonymity, an anonymity that will be very helpful in breaking the rules, but also very helpful in allowing one to forget oneself to become something else. The interesting thing about the Venetian masks is how mysterious and strange they are. They even black out the eyes. Uh, you know, there's some sort of makeup applied under the mask. The beauty and such, there's always this haunting quality about Venetian masks. Why do masks have the quality that they do? Um, uh, the Brothers Quay mentioned something very interesting. That it is very difficult to read the mask. Like a puppet. It's an immovable face. And so you don't have a sense of, of uh, readily understanding what's going on behind the mask. And it is this tension between what's on the surface and what's underneath that will go into all that we discuss for the rest of this video. Because whether it's the clown laughing on the outside, crying on the inside, or the people disguising what who they really are uh, in order to commit crimes with masks. Uh, the mask allows us to adopt other personas. Now, one of the most important parts about the mask is that it also became part of theater, and particularly the Commedia dell'arte. The Commedia dell'arte has many what we would call stock figures, that is to say, figures that are always the same character. Uh, this one, for instance, looks like a harlequin, um, <clears throat> and a harlequin looks like this. Uh, lots of different patchwork clothes. Another figure is Pulcinella, uh, who also wears a certain kind of a mask, which is a certain kind of a character. Now, harlequin is a kind of a rascally servant, and... Pulcinella is a little bit more actively problematic and, uh, in some cases, becomes evil. And notice the difference in the masks between the two. This is Polichinelle, the French version of Pulcinella, who eventually becomes a puppet, along with uh, another character who is very important, Punch, whom we will discuss later in England. One of the most important figures on our way to understanding the clown is a stock figure who eventually becomes called simply Clown. And it's a kind of a white pasty face character. Uh, he often has black button kind of balls and a white uh, dress kind of thing, a cloaked head with a certain kind of cap. And in France, this character took on a certain name, Pierrot, uh, and Pierrot is a um, is a very beloved character in France. Very kind of a naive, dumb, foolish character. Uh, in this picture, we have uh, also uh, Enrique Caruso uh, doing a uh, posing as Pagliacci, 
uh, another clown, variant on uh, the clown in Commedia dell'arte. Interestingly enough, though, this clown is not a good clown. <laughs> and he ends up becoming full of vengeance and, and ends up killing uh, in the name of jealousy and love. There were different characters, a certain Mr., uh, I believe it was Giuseppe Grimaldi, actually Joseph Grimaldi, he was English, came up with a certain kind of more elaborate uh, use of makeup for the clown. You notice the extreme red on the cheeks. Um, and he was followed by other people uh, following either Perot or uh, often, as you can see with uh, Grimaldi, his character is a little closer to Harlequin. Here are three uh, circus workers, circus clowns in America in the early 20th century. And quite clearly, these guys have are getting further away from the more stock representations, and there will be distinctive American versions of the clown. We're going to watch now a bit of a video uh, starring Lon Chaney, who studied the uh, 17th and 18th century uh, clowns, particularly Grimaldi, and... For his uh, presentation, this is called He Who Laughs. We're just going to watch it now, and you'll see some very interesting things in it. He's getting hit over and over. He Who Gets Slapped is the name of this film. And it's all about, everyone thinks it's funny, but he is putting himself through this uh, torture continually because of things in his past. And he feels like he... He wants to be punished like this. Watch this. The clown reaches down pulls out his heart, rips it off, and holds it up to the audience. And they find it funny. Now this was all choreographed in the movie. It's choreographed by he. That's the only name given to the clown. H-E-E. -E. Um, and then there's a, this amazing clown procession now, I don't think you'd ever see something like this in a real circus because that's a lot of clowns. <laughs> Most circuses can't afford to have like 20, 30, 40 clowns. But they have a ritual burial. The clown is an inversion of the king, just as the jester is the inversion of the king. But he also represents someone whose emotions are all disguises. And uh, the funeral hall breaks there, and the clowns just keep walking. And it's actually quite a deep uh, piece. I would recommend going back and finding this film and watching the entire thing in the best possible version of, uh, you can, which would not be on YouTube. There's much, much better versions that you can buy as a, uh, certainly a DVD, maybe a Blu-ray. Well, anyway, there were then American forms of clownery. We kind of got a hint of it with those clown uh, circus workers we saw earlier. One of the most... Uh, Taboo forms to discuss is blackface. This is uh, Burt Williams, actually a black man, who's darkening his skin much more to play a black man in the uh, to play blackface in a minstrel performance. But American performers started playing you know, hobos and beggars, uh, bums. This is Emmett Kelly, who, when I was young, was considered the most famous clown there was in America. And obviously, with all the children around him, he was seen as a kind and gentle character. This is a rodeo clown. And again, I remember going to a few rodeos. Whenever you go to a rodeo, there are rodeo clowns. Rodeo clowning, however, 
I think has to go on record as being perhaps the most dangerous form of clowning there is. You're dealing with massive animals with horns, and the clown has to look like he's having fun, getting hurt, and there's a huge animal there. Now, at a certain point, we come to the 1950s in America, and the clown, like the puppet, like the magic show, are kind of being chased out of... Uh, they used to perform in places besides the circus. The clowns also performed, often without makeup, on what was called vaudeville, which was a combination of movies and musicians. And, uh, you know, you'd have a movie, then you'd have acts, and then another movie. It was a whole all-day affair that people would go. And there was no television. But then television came. And so what happens is the clowns end up showing up on television. And uh, in this one, you have a clown named Clarabelle. Uh, which is a strange name for a clown that looks like that. Um, and you have uh, a sense of that the clowns are just for fun, but this is where the clowns start to get more elaborate makeup. This is uh, Bozo the Clown, very famous clown. Uh, and in fact, Bozo is the template for Ronald McDonald. This is the earliest image of Ronald McDonald on television, who looks radically different from the standard, more bozo-esque uh, Ronald McDonald. Everything boys and girls like to do, especially when it comes to eating those delicious McDonald's hamburgers. A magic tray here keeps me well supplied. Who's our McFavorite hamburger clown? I'm off to McDonald's to see all the boys and girls. Have a nice trip, Ron. Bones, bones. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Interestingly enough, Ronald McDonald is no longer much of a mascot for McDonald's. And I wonder why. It's because clowns have ceased to signify fun, much, much to the sorrow of the clown unions. This is Lon Chaney again. Uh, the clown unions and associations uh, across the world, because their art now is just considered at best, kitty entertainment, but at worst, something else. Interestingly enough, there's been a connection with clowns and death for a while. There's another art form completely related to the clown, often seen as kind of its other side, and that's miming. We're going to watch now a bit of a performance by the great Jean-Louis Berrault from the film Les Enfants du Paradis, and watch how he conveys action. And of course he is, he, and becomes later, Pierrot in the film. Now, another great mime is uh, the one more, more people know the name of. It's Marcel Marceau. We're going to watch a little bit more of him here, and then we can have something serious to say about mimes in a moment. This is for him being a waiter, and I'll let his action show you. This is a, a waiter, and then now he's playing the uh, the customer. <laughs>
disgusted by the guy. Now, we are going to uh, keep an eye on that white face. That's going to become very important to us a little later. And the white face is kind of ghostly. But here's an interesting one. This is where Marcel Marceau, in a very famous piece called The Cage, and of course, this is the thing everyone does when they're trying to pretend to be a mime, is, is to pretend there's like uh, something in front of them, like glass or bars, and then to slide along it, which is which everyone gets this imitation from this particular piece. And Marceau was a genius for doing this. Now, what's interesting is that this is also a very existentialist piece. He basically is looking for the edges to, of the cage. He's just walking along. Suddenly there's an impediment in front of him, and he goes around it and keeps looking, and what happens is the cage gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And tried, finally, we're not going to watch the whole thing, but finally he tries to get out, punches his way through it, starts walking it again, and comes to another cage, finds himself encircled. And of course, this is this uh, very French, very existentialist metaphor for life, that life is a cage. And, you know, in certain darker moments, you can certainly feel this. But now what's important about this is the sense of it's, it's both a high art and it's clowning. And this becomes very much a part of European style clown work. And this is going to lead in a certain direction. Notice how it's getting smaller and smaller. He's just stuck all by himself. Sorry, I have to talk during this, but I want you to understand it without having to watch the whole thing. Here's another French uh, master, Jacques Lecoq. And he was very important in using the mask. Notice what happens. He's, he's actually giving kind of a lecture demonstration on the mask. And notice what happens as soon as he puts the mask on. It completely changes who he is, and he knows this. And notice also that it's a blank mask. That is to say, there's nothing, no real personality in the mask. And again, there's really something philosophical going on here. This is not simply, oh, I'm going to wear a mask, ha ha. And it relates to something else. The pantomiming that we see in old silent films. Now, one of the things many people don't realize about silent films is that they were all pantomime. Most of the acting in silent films was pantomime. Now, this, of course, is from The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. This is the great Conrad Veidt, who shall become more important to our story. This is 1920. And notice the style of acting. Very unreal, coming from two things. One, coming from uh, the theater and what had been happen happening in symbolist uh, theater and symbolist dramatic representation, but also coming from the world of clowning and pantomiming. Pantomimes used to be not just a uh, the kind of mime work we saw Marcel Marceau doing, but a whole uh, style of representation without words on the theater. And this was very popular in the 19th century. But of course, this is very mysterious. And the character of Dr. Caligari figures very much in where we are going. There's something related to, from uh, Dr. Caligari to Joker here. Now, another thing that's very important in our treatment is Samuel Beckett, an Irishman who ended up living in uh, France, uh, also caught this kind of uh, modernist existentialist wave of theatrical presentation. Let's listen to a moment from his classic Waiting for Godot. Our savior, two thieves. One is supposed to have been saved and the other... Damn. Saved from what? Hell. I'm going. <laughs> and yet, how is it? This is not boring you, I hope. <laughs> and though these two people, to our eyes, don't necessarily look like clowns, in a way, that is exactly what they are. Clowns in Europe 
have uh, taken on these existentialist tones as well. And there's a difference in Europe between the circus clown and what's called the theatrical clown. Many of the theatrical clowns follow in the wake of Beckett's uh, characters in Godot. They are also extremely <gasps> existential and absurd. And this absurdity is not just like funny, but has a point. That was Le Polu. And the other character here is Ludor Citric. Now, if you look at this, you're starting to get an idea of the evil clown. But what's interesting is it's not the evil clown that we know from our usual... Um, it's not the evil clown we know in America. It's this strange, existentially dark character. Now, what's interesting is that I've heard about the training schools for these, these kinds of theatrical clowns. And it's almost as if manners and morals don't exist in these places. They start living the life of this naive but extremely grotesque figure. It's good. Here's a more traditional uh, European clown, but again, with this uh, modernist element to it. I really like this guy. And that was from a whole night of uh, theatrical presentation where he'll go through various uh, costumes and changes. And it's not uh, simply uh, have a good time. There's definitely a message going on beneath the surface there. And then we come to America again. Now in America, something had happened. When I was a child, and people like Emmett Kelly and, uh, you know, even Bozo and, and Ronald McDonald on television. Uh, these clowns, nobody thought they were scary. Not in the sense we do today, certainly. There may have been a few people who had coulorophobia, which I guess means clown fear, which is not even in the uh, medical encyclopedias. But, but nevertheless, no one really had anything like that. There were probably kids who reacted uh, strangely to these white masked figures. But this would have been a very strange notion in the past. But here is one of the first clowns that people started to call frightening. And this is actually the serial killer, John Wayne Gacy. What makes him so frightening is that he was a clown for, you know, different occasions. And at the same time, would invite young men over to his house, kill them and bury them in his crawl space beneath the house. Which then brings us to this. And of course, this is Pennywise from Stephen King's It. And Stephen King's It, his long novel, uh, gets a lot of, uh, shall we say, the blame for making clowns evil. That is to say, he took them, and, and here he explains his own philosophy on why clowns seemed evil to him, or at least frightening. Well, you know, as a kid going to the circus, it would be like, 12 full-grown people that would all pile out of a little tiny car. Their faces were dead white. Their mouths were red as though they were full of blood. They're all screaming. Their eyes are huge. What's not to like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, Why yeah. were your clowns right. screaming? <laughs> then you started getting joke things within a year after that, like Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Killer Clowns from Outer Space. It's crazy. Kiss me, fat boy. <laughs> and of course the inevitable TV version of Stephen King's It and here Tim Curry choose some scenery but from there things just take off and uh, one of the things that happens is by the mid 90s you have a group called the Insane Clown Posse 
who wears clown makeup and sings a kind of uh, metal rap, uh, what we probably call new metal. Their shows just go over the edge with just crazy, again, very similar to the existentialist clown training in Europe of people just acting like complete idiots and there are no more rules to behavior. So these guys just spray each other with uh, various forms of uh, soda. Uh, they rap. People go nuts and then become juggalos, is the name of the folks with the insane clown posse. And what motivates the juggalos? Are juggalos hated? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're f***ing hated, so. despised, <laughs> spit on, pissed on. The Juggalos are extremely despised and have been under investigation for their antics. What attracted you to each other? Was it magnets? It uh, wasn't meth. magnets. Meth. Meth was my second guess. I think it was my <laughs> It was meth. And then after that, everything is crazy. Here's one of the most frightening clowns of all, uh, Rob Zombie's uh, Captain Spaulding. And uh, try to look at this image of a clown. The clown has gone from, well, literally, the clown has gone from being a figure of fun to being, in this film, a real murderer. And this film is The Devil's Rejects. What's the matter, kid? Don't you like clowns? Why? Don't we make you laugh? Aren't we funny? You best come up with an answer, because I'm going to come back here and check on you and your mama. If you ain't got a reason why you hate clowns, I'm going to kill your whole family. All right, now get your ass out the car. Come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Sid Haig portrays easily one of the most sinister clowns ever uh, in uh, The Devil's Rejects and also The House of a Thousand Corpses, which then brings us also to this strange movie that came out in 2014 simply called Clown, in which the clown, like Pennywise, ends up being a demon. And like uh, Stephen King said, it's the strangeness of the clown that is now affecting us, which is really unusual. So what used to convey uh, a sense of fun, and that uh, someone would put on this cosmetic makeup, uh, cosmetic mask, and then be fun for you. Now, the clown is something very different. Which is really odd, because we live for fun. Our society thinks fun is the reason to do everything. And I've heard people literally say things to me like, Well, as long as everyone's having fun, right? Like, to excuse whatever behavior. You know, uh, you know, and, and, you know, that everything ends up being fun. Well, why did the clown not become fun? And I have a theory about this. And my theory is this. The clown no longer represents fun because the clown represented a different attitude towards fun. Fun was something when you went to the circus, a clown made you laugh. And they really did. I've seen clown shows that were just hysterical. And I love them as children. And, you know, if I see a good clown show now, I love them. Not the existentialist clown shows. Those don't make me laugh much. They do have funny moments, though. Uh, not this new frightening thing. Although, I have to admit, Heath Ledger's Joker had some very funny parts. And uh, we're coming to the Joker in a minute here, in case you're wondering. But, uh, but here's the thing. Now we want our fun to be endless. It's like we want life to be fun, always. So the clown no longer represents a moment where you go somewhere and you have fun. You know, or that fun is something, you know, it's just like eating, going to the circus is a great analogy. You go there, if you're young enough, you know, you can ride the roller coaster, you can watch the, you know, different things, you can laugh. It's a moment of entertainment. Entertainment being that suspension across two poles is what the word means. And you're in the middle. You're suspended. But now, what's happened is we've kicked out the poles and we expect life to always suspend us in an entertaining way. And you know what? The clown doesn't represent the temporary moments of fun anymore. 
So what we want our fun to be realistic. We want our video games to get more and more real. We want our our movies to be more and more real. We want our fantasy to be more and more real. And of course, real itself as a as a concept has changed as a result. You know, what does it mean to be real? Well, the clown comes along, and the clown, as Stephen King reacts to, he doesn't look like anybody real. So he's no longer wearing the mask, making you laugh. He's no longer the fool. So what is he? He's mysterious. And so we started to get a very strange sort of thing start to happen just a few years ago. And this happened in America, where people would see close to Halloween time, people dressed as clowns just standing on the side of the road. Now, sometimes uh, people would film these, and they're obviously set up. But other times, I think people actually would, someone go out there and just stand in clown makeup just to be scary. And that is a very, very strange concept. What does it mean to just choose to be this scary clown? This is good. This, these are actual photographs of people standing outside somewhere just being scary, like on a deserted road. Is that Bozo or Pennywise? Probably Pennywise. Although Bozo would be just as scary to see on the side of the road. And like I said, this one this one's gotta be a setup because they keep seeing them over and over. Oh well I'm Pennywise the dancing clown. Pennywise? Yes, meet Georgie. Georgie, meet Pennywise. <laughs> now we aren't strangers, are we? In this environment, you now come to the new version of Pennywise. And by this time, the clown is still the clown, but now he's really a demon. The clown is a demon. Can you smell the circus, Georgie? There's peanuts. Cotton candy, hot dogs, and popcorn! Is that your favorite? Uh huh. I do! <laughs> because they pop. <laughs> pop, 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 pop. <laughs> and the demon knows your darkest fears. And it's strange to have a clown be the bearer of that inside information about your darkest fears. And so the clown is completely inverted as an image from fun to fear. And poor clowns. Well, I did. we are talking about the Joker here. And to talk about the Joker, we have to go back to the Middle Ages. And again, to talk about the jester or the fool. And of course, we have these uh, typical jester's caps here, and they often carry the stick, the marat, uh, with bells or, or uh, jangles and other objects on it. And interestingly enough, the fool tells the king things that nobody else can tell the king. And a lot of people think, well, that's because they weren't very smart. They could get away with it. Maybe a few. But in fact, most court jesters were very intelligent. You had to be to be in that environment and survive. So, one of the things we think about with the court jester is the laugh. And he makes you laugh, but he's also a comical character himself. I'm also reminded of the tarot deck and the fool. And the fool was originally a wandering kind of beggar character. And the fool and the jester end up in card, uh, card games becoming the joker. And of course, the Joker harkens back to the court jesters, and many playing decks have a Joker. Joker cards are actually aren't that old, They're about the middle of the... Actually, I think the first ones were in the Civil War in America, but they became a stock feature of uh, playing card decks. 
And it is from these playing card jokers that we will eventually get our Batman Joker. Notice that one looks like a Harlequin on the side. And in fact, the Joker's outfit is, a, uh, rather the Jester's outfit is a bit Harlequinish. Which then brings us to another important character. And uh, remember, I mentioned the Commedia dell'arte. When the Commedia dell'arte came to England about 500 years ago, they brought with them the character of Punchinella, who eventually just becomes Punch, the puppet. Now, what most people don't realize is Punch, the puppet, is one of the most evil characters in all of fiction. Because this Punch not only kills his wife and kills his baby, but in some versions he kills the devil, kills uh, death, although in the version we're about to watch, uh, death, uh, the ghost of his wife whom he kills, comes back for him. But he has no, he's a psychopath, pure and simple. And of course there's always the menacing grin. And it's that grin we're going to be focusing on. So this is from 1901. Typical show. Right now he's fighting with his wife. He, the wife dies. Comes. I think that's the wife coming back as a ghost. Either that or it's the figure of death. But I'm going to go with it's Judy. And Judy and Punch just bang each other up. But they show up in other versions too. This is was mistakenly called Punch and Judy by Jan Schwankmeyer. But we have a Harlequin type character with the Punch, the Czech type Punch, who is uh, not a hamster. Uh, the Czech... Or is that a guinea pig? What's the difference? Anyway, uh, in the Czech uh, version, is called Kasparek. And again, they bash each other to pieces. But uh, now we come to the real inspiration. So we take some figure like the Joker or the Jester, the Fool, the playing cards, and then we mix that with some of the psychotic nature of Punch. And we add one more ingredient and that's from Victor Hugo's The Man Who Laughs, Lum Kiri. Uh, and what's interesting, this is about a story. It, Victor Hugo invented this group of people called the Comprachicos, who come along and they kidnap children and they carve them into figures who will be like court jesters or buffoons. And in this one, they steal, steal this boy and carve his face into a permanent grin. Now, there there is no group called the Comprachicos that we know of, but these kinds of people certainly did exist in different places. People who would uh, purposely deform children uh, to create them. I often think that if we find a way to make our dreams into entertainment, there will be people who deform their children's dreams by giving them traumas to make money off them. So, uh, you know, that's maybe in the future uh, when people talk about... Uh, Tapping into the, your neural network to produce uh, images. You know, there's a whole world right there, but that's different. Anyway, Conrad Veidt stars as the man who laughs in the movie version. And it's all about that grin. Of course, in the movie version, the important thing is the grin hides a complete sorrow. And so uh, he he is often in deep pain, but he can't show it because... He is, uh, his mouth always shows this extreme laugh, which is very similar to the new Joker film, but we'll get to that. Meanwhile, then there is the Joker. The Joker is created out of this, but like I said, he's not simply the man who laughs. He is also, uh, the, the punch character, the psychopath. He is also the playing card. And uh, this is from Brian Bullen's and Alan Moore's version of the Joker. Here's the original appearance of the Joker in Detective Comics around 1940. And the original Joker was something much more of a psychopath. Um, but eventually, by the 1960s, in what's called the, the original period of Superman or Batman, is called the Golden Age of Comics. The Silver Age is the 1960s. And eventually, he becomes a funny character, particularly as interpreted by someone like Cesar Romero on the rather campy television show, uh, Batman. <laughs> Come, my comic cohort and crime! <laughs>
uh, kind of forgotten in all of this, right around the same time, cashing in on uh, the Batman series, was uh, they, they came out with these cards, uh, playing cards, which had these amazing illustrations done by um, classic 1950s uh, book illustrator Norm Saunders. And these convey a lot more menace than the television series ever did. Because, I, again, he was working from a, a hard-boiled detective film noir kind of angle. And then, there, of course, there's Jack. Or is it Jack? Jack. Jack is dead, my friend. You can call me Joker. And Jack Nicholson's version is a little bit more like... Uh, Cesar Romero's, but a little bit more serious and scary in minimal ways, but uh, kind of goofy scary. Uh, that's t uh, Tim Burton's movies, though. Meanwhile, you have Frank Miller's interpretation of the Joker in his Dark Knight Returns, and that leads to, directly to Heath Ledger's interpretation and uh, this is one basically for the ages. No one ever thought anyone could possibly do another great Joker after this one. Honor, respect. Look at you. What do you believe in, huh? What do you believe in? I believe whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you a stranger. jokes were bad. And, of course, Ledger's own uh, tragic story so that he dies before the film comes out. He wins a Best Supporting Academy Award. Um, amazing performance. One thing forgotten in all of this is the Judy character of Punch and Judy. And they could be quite scary as well. This is from a French puppet of a Judy character. Uh, those teeth almost look real. And then here's a female Joker from a 1980s poster from Italy. And then, of course, there was the Holly, Harley Quinn on television, who is interesting in being one of the few characters to originate on television and then go back to the comic books and eventually in digital forms. And then uh, Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn became something, in fact, uh, maybe a little too much of an icon, girls started immediately dressing up as her for uh, Halloween, creating a girl uh, clown image. But evidently in the next uh, installment of the Harley Quinn story of Birds of Prey, she's more of a feminist. I'm not gonna go into that, but, uh, and here she is wearing the Jester's clothing with uh, Jared Leto's uh, Joker. The interest in masks has continued to grow, and here are new styles of Venetian masks emphasizing the dark character of our contemporary use of masks. And of course, who can forget this mask, which is the Guy Fox mask, which has been used in quite a few uh, demonstrations. Uh, again, it was an Alan Moore story, a V for Vendetta, which had a lot to uh, do with creating this as an anarchist icon. But what's strange is it also has some relationship because of the blank quality to clowns and clown masks, which then leads to this, something like The Purge, where people are allowed to wreak havoc and kill one night a week. But is it much different than something like what's going on with Antifa? Again, now we see masks coming back into public use. Um, and it is a strange sort of world we now live in, where people hide behind masks, much like the Purge movies, much like... I mean, you can see the trajectory here. What's going to happen in a few years? Well, people are starting to make laws about people who are protesting wearing masks in certain places. And then... Earlier this year, a very strange kind of homemade animated video showed up. And it was something about Clown World and this weird...
Pepe the Frog, whose history I won't go into here, is turned into what many people, many people call a hunkler. And he goes around, and instead of creating problems, he makes everybody happy. But essentially, it's clown world. And so everybody's a clown. He comes by and makes everybody happy. In a way, it's a very strange critique. Some people have tried to say it was a... Uh, kind of a right-wing thing. It's hard to know, but what it is pointing to is the insanity of the chaos of the times. So it's kind of like we've got the weird existentialist clowns, we've got the uh, the fearful clowns, we've got the renewed use of masks, we've got entertainments that feature masks, protests that feature masks, and we've got a society, you know, more than one society at the moment is in chaos through just the sheer noise of information coming to us. Not just the audio noise, but there is sure, certainly a lot of aural noise going around. But also the visual noise, whether it's Times Square in New York or, or whether it's the Internet, we are just filled with images and information and sounds. And you know, I'm living here in Tbilisi, Georgia, and it's here too. You know, that is to say, this is a big city, a million and a half people, and it's noisy, and people bring out the electronic dance music for, like, everything. And it just is a menacing rhythm that just goes on and on and on. And it just creates noise. It doesn't create uh, festivity. It creates background noise. So, where are we? Well, into this environment, which is rife with political posturings and rife with uh, confusion steps the new joker movie and when i saw this i immediately said to myself oh there's a reason this just hit all of the uh, box office records for an october movie and that is because oh what's interesting is of course we just had the new uh, part two of of stephen king's it film which came and is the number one film of the year but i have the feeling this film is going to overtake it and it'll be very interesting to see what happens uh, with this. Well, actually, I think uh, Marvel's Endgame, Avengers Endgame, was uh, probably the biggest hit of all. But what's interesting is that's kind of like the end of an era. I mean, Marvel movies are going to continue. And it's also quite clear they're going to try to have more diversity and to essentially preach to people about you know, exactly how they should live. Um, where this movie comes along doesn't have that message at all and immediately people are freaked out and in a sense much like Heath Ledger's Joker who is much more of a anarchist ideologue than uh, Joaquin uh, Phoenix's Joker is nevertheless both these Jokers are basically saying it is all confusion and chaos um this film, of course, follows the, uh, the story of a man who is afflicted with the ability to laugh at the wrong time as a, as a medical condition. And uh, this gets him in trouble, but eventually, not only it's not just trouble, but he starts to see himself in a certain way. Now, he, he comes from an abusive house, a crazy mother, again. Yeah, if you've gotten this far and think I'm not going to spoil this movie, you're in the wrong spot. I'm going to seriously spoil it in a couple of seconds here and tell you things you haven't been hearing on other uh, Joker-related programs. Anyway, uh, there's more to this as well. Check out this image. This is uh, Joaquin Phoenix with this all-white mask. It harks back to the mimes. More importantly, though, it harks to Buto, which is a Japanese form of of theater, extreme, extreme emotional and physical anxiety. It is a an art of pain and very modernist as well. And again, the mask of pure white, the, the pale neutral mask, which the French did so much to uh, create. And of course, there are now Joker masks as well. Interestingly enough, in the film, you get people who are adopting uh, clown masks as, again, emblems of protest and emblems of fear. And I think that the film is making a very clear relationship to these kind of crazy protesters who are not 
like right wing protesters. They are left wing protesters protesting inequality, protesting the rich getting richer, very much Occupy Wall Street, but even more so Antifa. Now, Occupy Wall Street was not the kind of movement Antifa is. Antifa comes along and is essentially just out of control. And we see people wearing the masks. <clears throat> but Joker comes along as this damaged, bruised, uh, crazy guy who has been set upon. But as he goes, rather than on any sort of redemptive arc, he is going towards insanity, leading up to his final moment where he goes on a talk show. The last 20 minutes or so of the movie are just insane. But it all it really kicks off when he enters this talk show where Robert De Niro is playing Murray Franklin, a uh, television host, uh, very much connected to uh, the king of comedy, where Robert De Niro was playing essentially the Joaquin Phoenix character, a guy named Rupert Pupkin, who was obsessed with uh, comedy and going and eventually uh, gets on stage and it basically tells people he's got the uh, the host tied up and he really does he's gone crazy but he wants everyone to accept him and they do so Joaquin Phoenix is about to re redo this except and this is where I think uh, Todd Phillips's version here is quite amazing I was uh, I sat through about you know two thirds or more of this movie, saying, "Wow, this is an amazing evocation and homage to uh, Martin Scorsese's films, uh, to '70s films, and, and another film you can find in here is uh, Network, uh, a certain kind of like I'm mad as hell, not going to take it anymore. Also, uh, an homage to." Uh, the way New York itself felt at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. Now, I arrived in New York during this period, and I can attest it was pretty much like this. The one major difference between this film and that era was that this film is uh, has these characters protesting, uh, which is not a, an emblem of that period, not in that way. There were not people uh, chanting in the streets wearing clown masks or any equivalent like Antifa today. So I think Todd Phillips was basically, he's also talking about uh, what we now term things like cancel culture, where people just gang up on anyone. Like if, if someone finds a tweet of yours or, or a photo of yours from like 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, they will turn it on you to say you're basically always this. There's a, a, a determinism in the way people look at people now. Once you're something, you can you are always that thing. If you said something wrong at one point, any kind of mistake, you are always that person. And Walking Phillips is about to walk out here and essentially just blast this. Now I haven't got the whole conversation, and um, I'm not going to play you the. Denouement. But I will say this. I'm. This is a little clip that I got from the theater itself. But you just need to hear these words. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how it all fits into the plot. You need to go see the movie. But I will say this. This is the central part of the film. This is what it all comes down to, is this speech. And listen to it. Comedy is subjective, Murray. Isn't that what they say? All of you... The system that knows so much, you decide what's right or wrong the same way that you decide what's funny or not. Okay, I, I think I, I might understand that you did this to start a movement to become a, a symbol. Come on, Murray. Do I look like the kind of clown that could start a movement? I killed those guys because they were awful. Everybody is awful these days. It's enough to make anyone crazy. Okay, so that's it. You're crazy. That's your defense for killing three young men? No. They couldn't carry a tune to save their lives. Oh, why is everybody so upset about these guys? If it was me dying on the sidewalk, you'd walk right over me. I pass you every day and you don't notice me. But these guys, what, because Thomas Wayne would cry about them on TV? You have a problem with Thomas Wayne. Too. Yes, I do. Have you seen what it's like out there, Murray? Do you ever actually leave the studio? Everybody just yells and screams at each other. Nobody's civil anymore. Nobody thinks what it's like to be the other guy. 
You think men like Thomas Wayne ever think what it's like to be someone like me? To be somebody but themselves? They don't. They think that we'll just sit there and take it like good little boys. That we won't werewolf and go wild. You finished? I mean, there's so much self-pity out there. You sound like you're making excuses for killing those young men. Not everybody, and I'll tell you this, not everyone is awful. But you're awful, Murray. Me? I'm awful? Oh yeah, how am I awful? Playing my video. Inviting me on the show. You just wanted to make fun of me. You're just like the rest of them. So, essentially, the film is accusing us of living in times where people refuse to listen anymore. And it's not saying this in order to give credence to either the people riding on the street or the Joker. The Joker is not made out to be a hero in this film, nor, nor are the people on the street. They are seen as all essentially giving in to the call of chaos. And this is what I saw of this film, especially at the end where walking is, uh, got uh, blood on his face from uh, uh, a car accident he was in. He creates a smile out of the blood. Evidently, it was possible it was even going to be he cuts his own face, but fortunately, they didn't quite go that far. Although that would have been a moment from the man who laughs, essentially. But like the man who laughs, he is he, he cannot control his emotions. That is to say, his, his inside, he might be fearful, angry, weeping. And yet he breaks into laughter. It's exactly the same kind of tension you find in the man who laughs when playing. The, 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 the man is often outside just this, he just makes people laugh, but inside he is breaking. And I think that, uh, Joaquin Phoenix's performance here is absolutely astounding. I really doubt anyone's going to come along and give a better performance. He really should win the best actor. But it doesn't matter, because what matters is what's being said here. And essentially, I look at this film as a warning. It's a warning saying that we have entered perilous times, where chaos is erupting. It erupts, you know, you cannot trust the news media anymore. Uh, you cannot trust, uh, you know, what you see with your own eyes hardly because it's all interpreted before the end of, you know, as soon as someone knows something, uh, what was it Tim Poole the other day in, in his reporting, who's, who's doing a great job of trying to be someone not caught by the, the insanity of the chaos of the moment. But he said like, you know, it used to be the news you'd have, you know, days and weeks to go back and forth on the meaning of it. But now it happens with, before a day is done. It, the stories are already old. And uh, we've argued everyone already knows, quote unquote, what they think when they don't know anything, of course, because they're still in the, the barrage of the, the propaganda coming at them. But the barrage creates this chaotic mindset. And it's this mindset that is feeding the, whether it's internet trolls or Antifa or the, the political instability, the, 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 you know, it's just, um, and, and what's ironic about this film is how ambiguous it is. The film is not saying good things about the right or the left. The, and interestingly enough, there's another, uh, aspect of this film, and this relates back to the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, where in Caligari, one of the things you find is that at the end, and this is a very controversial ending, uh, it's all seen as a dream, and, uh, and which reverses the meaning of the film. Now, it, there's a way in which the final scene in the White Room, interestingly enough, they play uh, White Room by the Cream as a song in this, which is kind of an interesting thing. In, the, in this room, he's being interviewed by a psychiatrist, and you suddenly get this notion, what if the entire film was a dream of his inside the, the institution? Now, it's not stated. I don't think that's the case. It could be just time has passed. They caught him. He's in jail. And the, the, the implication is that he's killed her and trying to escape at the end. But it could all be like the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, a dream. And that the whole film was a dream in his head. 
it wouldn't, if someone told me that was actually the case, I wouldn't be that surprised. However, I think the way the film builds is it's kind of clear where the dreams end and where they don't. There is a one place where he's locked in the refrigerator. I tend to wonder how he got out of that, knowing something as I do about old refrigerators. But, um, nevertheless, it's, it, it, it's such that there's so many ambiguities in the film. People will read it in all sorts of different ways, but it is those ambiguities that I think are sparking conversation. I saw people talking about the film in Georgia after the film. The second time I saw the film, people applauded at the end of the film. But it's the ambiguities that are making us ask, and the fact that it's very much a film that is discussing our moment somehow. And so we need to ask questions of ourselves. And I, I look at the film as a warning. If we proceed any further to the Joker moment, we will have the eruption of insanity. And do we want that? Do we want the Joker as the king of the evil, dark clowns? I hope not. The sad, psycho, jester clown figure becomes the inverted image of the king for this like crazy clown world, this world of chaos. And the film Joker is a deep meditation upon the state of disorder, of hysterical propaganda, of cancel culture, of political instability, of meaninglessness in the early 21st century. If you read it right, I think it should be a call to think about where we are and maybe to weep and to work for something more real. Joker, interestingly enough, is about reality, or rather, the loss of it. While harking back to a time in cinema when special effects were less important than the human characters beneath the masks, the masks we now wear. Masks like those of that old Twilight Zone episode called The Masks. Masks that shaped the wearer to the mask. At long last, he's dead. Good. Now, let's celebrate. <laughs> What's the matter? What's the matter with you all? It is time that we looked away from our screens for a moment and began to search for ways to live again. And that won't be fun. That will be hard work. So anyway, this is Burn, your perhaps not friendly uh, neighborhood anadromist, uh, telling you, hey, Thanks for listening, <laughs> and thanks for spending all the time getting through this thing. You may disagree with everything I say. Write it down there. You may agree. I'll take that. Uh, I do need your subscriptions. I'm trying to build up a little bit of steam on this channel to help me here with my life in Georgia. And if you want to get behind the paywall, you can subscribe at $10 a month or a single time of $50 or more contribution will get you uh, at least 15 or more hours of extra content fairly soon here. So uh, subscribe. There's a PayPal link below. Uh, that would be good. But, you know, I'm just grateful you spent a, a chunk of time listening to this. And I hope it's been meaningful and that I had something to add to the conversation. And, uh, you know, it was interesting when I was at the Joker movie when I was done, I was in Georgia. I turned and looked, and there were about 20 people left in the theater. It wasn't a huge theater. I saw it a very early show for only 10 lari. 10 lari translates into about mm, 
three and a half dollars. So, you know, I'll let you be spoiled on that. But, uh, ooh, I said the spoil word. Um, but, uh, but no, it's, um, you know, it's, it was interesting because people were sitting there talking about the film. You don't see that at the end of Marvel movies. You don't see that at the end of Star Wars. People don't talk about these films. They just, uh, Martin Scorsese recently said they were like, they're like, uh, uh, theme park rides. They are, you know, you know, some of them are great, you know, uh, but the Joker wasn't a comic book movie. It was a movie about something that could have really happened. And I think that was a very interesting, uh, choice. So anyway. Thanks for listening. Remember, anadromous means swimming against the tide. Think about doing that in your own life. How do you swim against the tide? I'll check you later. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments. lie to you folks. We told you we had living, breathing monstrosities. You laughed at them, shuddered at them, and yet, but for the accident of birth, you might be even as they are.